This Friday in the New York Times, someone wrote these comments. My brain is overloaded and ready to explode over all that's being written about the coming elections and our political disaster. My advice, go to the movies. <laughs> Better yet, rent singing in the rain. That was in the New York Times on Friday. It would be hard to find a better feel-good musical than Singing in the Rain with songs like Make Em Laugh, uh, Fit as a Fiddle, Moses Supposes, and Singing in the Rain with all of their incredible dance breaks. You can't find anything better to lift up your spirits. And like all classic musicals, Singing in the Rain includes a love story. This one is between a film star named Don Lockwood, who was played, of course, by the famous Gene Kelly, and the other, <laughs> got a Gene Kelly fan there, okay. <laughs> and the romance is between Don Lockwood and a budding new wannabe actress named Kathy Selden, and of course Debbie Reynolds played her in the movie. In the 1985 Broadway musical, the role of Don was played by a guy named Don, a guy named Don Correa. Many people outside of New York wouldn't know that name, but back in the 1980s, people in the theater world knew Don as one of the great dancers in musical theater. He was perfect for the role, and some of you would know of Don's wife of 38 years, Sandy Duncan. That's Don's wife. The role of Kathy Selden in the Broadway musical was played by an actress named Mary D'Arcy. Sherry and I know Mary, had supper with her a couple of years ago. I worked with her husband Carl in Summerstock before I moved to New York. Carl and Mary came to our wedding and I happen to have a story in my new book that involves Carl and Mary at our wedding reception. Most of you know someone who was in the 1985 Broadway production of Singing in the Rain because Sherry, my wife, was in the production. I wish she would have played Lena Lamont. She's very good at that. And she does too. And I'll get to that in a little while. Besides the traditional love story, the plot of the show revolves around the discovery of sound for motion pictures. It's dealing with the transition from silent films to what became known as talkies, or talking pictures. And as you might guess, this was not an easy transition. One of the funniest moments in the show is when they're trying to shoot a serious scene for the first time with a microphone, but they have all kinds of issues, everything from the microphone picking up unwanted sounds to people getting tangled up in its cord and even trying to find places to hide the microphone so it can't be seen. There were lots of challenges, failures, and miscues, but eventually things got better. It took a lot of work, but of course now we're blessed to have incredible movies with sound. Things are always changing, developing. Even our bodies are constantly changing. Science tells us that you and I get a new body every seven years. Not one cell, not one molecule that was in your body seven years ago is there today. I'm excited because this happens to be my seventh and last year with this particular body. <laughs> I'm due for a new one next year. We know that change will occur in our lives. Good things will happen to us, bad things will happen to us. We will interact with wonderful people, build friendships, and then we will lose some friendships. People move away, people die. Things are constantly changing. Most of us can handle change okay if it is something positive in our lives, but the challenge, of course, is handling change when it, when it hurts, when it's difficult, when it's tough. How do we sing 
in the rain. So for today, let's imagine the phrase singing in the rain as a metaphor for successfully adapting to change, even embracing change, especially when it involves something challenging and difficult. On the Apostle Paul's first trip to Europe, he and his friend Silas go to Greece and end up in a town called Philippi. And there, Paul meets a woman named Lydia, who becomes the first European convert that we know of. So things start out well for Paul and Silas in Philippi, but it doesn't take long for them to get into some trouble. And I'm not going to go into why they were arrested. You can read about it in the book of Acts. But they end up being stripped of their clothing in front of a crowd, and then they are brutally beaten. Then they are thrown into prison. The guard is told to watch them carefully, so he decides to move them to the innermost cell, the dungeon. A first century prison without electricity would have been very dark. The innermost cell would have been darker than dark. And the two beaten and wounded men then have their feet put into stocks. It can't get any worse. What was Silas and Paul's reaction to having a really bad day? At midnight, the text says, at the darkest hour, they start singing, praying, and singing, and the text says that the other prisoners were listening to them. That's what you call singing in the rain. How were they able to sing during this incredibly difficult time? How were they able to remain positive and hopeful? When Sherry was cast in Singing in the Rain in 1985, you would think that she would have been on top of the world. You would have thought it was a good thing, but wouldn't anyone want to be on Broadway? But it was a very, very difficult time for Sherry. She was cast as something called the swing. A swing is similar to being an understudy, but there's a big difference. A a person who is an understudy usually focuses on one particular role, usually a lead role in the show. A person who is a swing understudies everyone in the chorus. In Singing in the Rain, Sherry understudied 13 roles, 13 women. So if one of them got sick or went on vacation or to a wedding or to a funeral, then Sherry went on. The good part was that each of the 13 women did something similar in the show. The bad part was that each of the 13 women also did something very different. Most of the time, Sherry would not know if she was going on until 45 minutes before the show. She'd have to show up backstage every night because the stage manager could say, someone just called in sick, you're on. Most nights, Sherry didn't go on, but that made it even more challenging, more difficult. She never got to practice, never got to go over it. All the other cast members were getting to do it every night. It was becoming second nature to them, but Sherry didn't get to do that. So she would wake up each day and start worrying about having to be in the show that night. And the anxiety would grow and grow throughout the day. And then around 7.15, she'd usually find out that she wasn't going on. And then she could relax and enjoy the evening. Which is funny because typically she's a morning person. But because of the show, the only time she could relax and not have anxiety was at night. And then one night, I get a call from her. Billy, I'm going on. So I run, go get a ticket so I can see her in the show. 
She had talked about having to wear this really tall hat that was difficult to balance on her head. She was worried about it falling off, and sure enough, in one of the scenes, the girls come out wearing a hat that looked to be about seven feet tall. It was taller than Sherry was. And she got through the scene without the hat falling or without her tumbling into the orchestra pit. So I thought we were home free. And I told myself that surely if the girl she was going on for had something difficult to do in the show, they would switch it up so that one of the regular dancers would do it, so that Sherry, who never got to practice, didn't have to do it. It was at that time I see Sherry running to center stage into the arms of Don Lockwood, Don Korea, the main character. And Don picks Sherry up and lifts her high in the air that she is now totally vertical, not horizontal, vertical with her toes pointing to the heavens. He kept her in that position for two hours. <laughs> or for what seemed like two hours, I couldn't believe it. It was very impressive, one of those things that takes your breath away if you're in the audience watching it, especially if you know the girl being lifted never got to practice. No one else in the audience knew that the girl who was being suspended upside down from the ceiling had never gotten to practice and had been scared to death before the show. And when I saw her afterwards, I said, that was crazy. How did you do it? Weren't you scared? She said, no, not really. You see, Don is such a strong dancer. He's so steady, so consistent, so good with his technique. All I had to do was trust him and let go. He did most of the work. How were Paul and Silas able to sing in the rain, sing in the stocks, sing in the darkness? I think Paul's response would have sounded a lot like Sherry's. I can do it because God is so strong. God is so steady, so consistent, so good. All I have to do is trust God and let go. God will do most of the work. Paul, after all, is the one who wrote, if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul is the one who said, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor anything to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the key to being able to sing in the rain is trusting God and God's love. Easier said than done, right? How do you learn to trust someone? You get to know them. And how do you get to know them? You spend time with them. You learn things about them, sometimes by reading about them, sometimes studying about them. And you learn about them from other people and how they help them. How do you learn to trust God? You get to know God. And how do you get to know God? You spend time with God. And you learn things about God. You read about God. You study about God. And you learn about God from other people and how God has helped them. When we're able to trust God, we not only can get through changes in life, we can embrace them. We can learn from them. We can grow. We can even celebrate them. One of our church members is 101 years old. Mae Johnson has seen a lot of changes in her life. In fact, I recently found out that Mae 
It's funny, I'm talking about her today. May had been a child actress in silent movies. There's a picture of little five-year-old May on the internet with the cast of a silent film called Silver Wings. When May was 80 years old, the Queens, New York native, moved to Savannah with her thick New York accent to live closer to her daughter, who was a member of Asbury. May felt like a fish out of water. She didn't know anyone. She thought she'd try the busy bees, would show up at one of their Monday groups, and so May carefully drove herself from her apartment by the Savannah Mall to the church. And after parking the car, and by the way, back then the busy bees met in the choir room, so you just opened the back door and there they were. But after parking the car, May began to get nervous about the whole thing as she walked to the door. And, and she opened that back door and all of the women of the busy bees turned their heads towards the door to see who was there. And May panicked and she shut the door, <laughs> got back in her car and drove home. But she didn't give up. She kept reaching out to people. She eventually became a busy bee and became part of other groups here at the church and she developed some very good friendships. She would later tell me as I got close to her that it took her a while to trust the love and hospitality she received here. She said that one of the things she had to get used to was all of the hugging and touching. She said, we never did any of that where I came from. After being in Savannah a number of years, May's family moved from Savannah to South Florida, so May had to make another big change, had to make, had to make the move to, to Florida to join her family. After being in Florida for about four or five months, I received this letter from her, and remember, this is someone in her 80s. This part's in the book. <laughs> Dear Billy, just a note to let you know that I am thinking of you and all the folks at Asbury. Also, I just had to let you know how the things I learned from you and the people at church have affected my life here in Florida. As you know, I am volunteering in the emergency room at University Hospital. She's volunteering in the emergency room in her 80s, getting hit, about to hit 90. My responsibility is to reassure the patients when they come in that they will be getting the best care possible. I try to make them comfortable, bring a warm blanket if they're cold, bring coffee, a soda, or whatever to the patient's family. But the important thing I have learned from you and the folks at Asbury is the importance of contact. I check on them as often as I can, reassure them with a touch on the shoulder, or so many of them reach out so that you can hold their hands. It calms them down when they are apprehensive. As I've told you, I was never a hugger or a toucher until I came to Asbury and now, because I realized how comforting this approach to people can be, I can help people. Last week, I was walking past the bed of a new patient, a tiny African-American lady about 85 years of age. She motioned to me, and I went to her bed. I could barely understand her. She was so weak. But finally, I realized that she wanted water. I checked with a doctor and then brought her some water, held the cup while she drank from the straw. She was in the emergency room for a long, long time, and when I had a chance, I would stop and help her to drink. After they decided to admit her, I went back to her while she was waiting for her room to be prepared upstairs. She was a little agitated and in pain, and I I held her hand. 
But suddenly, without thinking about what I was doing, I found myself running my fingers through her hair, as I always did with my children when they were upset. As she drifted off to sleep, I could hear her say softly, Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And they wheeled her away. I sudden, as they wheeled her away, I suddenly realized how I have grown. Of course, I do other things, file reports, answer the phone, run errands. But I enjoy the contact with patients and their families the most. Give my love to everyone at Asbury May. May has lived her entire life embracing change, even learning to be a toucher and a hugger in her 80s. She is living life in its fullness and making a difference in this world because she has learned to sing in the rain. Let us do likewise. Amen and amen.